I'm Tom Vassell. Welcome to Board Game Breakfast. Really glad to have you guys along with us. It's good to be back on schedule. We have a few weeks here before Essen, but there's a lot of reviews and a lot of things that are coming out as time goes by. We'll be posting our Essen schedule soon so you can see uh, what's what we're going to be doing there. We'll have a booth there in Hall 7, so we hope that you come by and say hi to us when there. Um, also, t-shirts. Now, we have some great t-shirts from the Dice Tower. You can go to our website. Uh, Chris Cormier does these shirts for us. And we have some new logos uh, that, that show the different uh, groupings of different people, the little dice mascots that we got made for the Dice Tower. And so if you want to get some of those, we don't really make a lot of money off t-shirts, uh, but we just put them up there basically so that people can wear them. And I think these new logos look really cool. So if you want to support the Dice Tower, or you just want to, by, by basically showing your support in a t-shirt, then that is what I would recommend to go there. Will I do a Q&A this week? Yes, when? Don't know. So um, mostly, I might do one later today, but since I just did one over the weekend, not sure that it's gonna be that close. I'm trying to spread them out a little bit. Anyhow, uh, oh, well, uh, that will come up later on in Dice Tower Productions, so I have some more information there. Meanwhile, let's get to the news. So this week, Renegade has announced that they'll be doing some expansions for Raiders of the North Sea. They're really jumping into this franchise feet first. They announced Raiders of the North Sea, then all the rest of the games. Now two new expansions, the Hall of Heroes and the Fields of Fame. They sound very exciting. There's more stuff for this Spiel des Jahres nominated game. Osprey has announced Samurai Gardner. That originally came out in Japan in 2013. It's a drafting game where you slap the cards as quickly as you can to get them. Uh, so it's not a drafting game, it's a slapping game, I guess. Um, that's going to appeal to some people or not. It doesn't sound like the slapping as quickly as you can meshes with the Samurai Gardener theme, but what do I know? Greenbrier has a new game, Vengeance, in which case you are trying to eliminate gangs. You're someone who has been betrayed. You are now swearing vengeance on everybody else, and you're going to go around and take these out. It's not a cooperative game. I mean, you're all trying to eliminate these bad gangs from the cities, but one person's going to win it. Uh, Fantasy Flight Games has announced Trials of Frostgate. This is a new app um, kind of uh, thing for Descent. So it's a bunch of trials, and you can go through and try to get a high score for them. It looks like this is the future support for Descent. They're just going to be doing stuff on the app because we haven't seen much physical stuff come from Descent, which I find a little bit unfortunate. Stronghold Games and Lotta Palette are doing Bottle Imp that's coming out this year. I've talked a lot about Bottle Imp as a trick-taking game. This is an excellent one, works really well for three players. Uh, I, I, I hope that the graphic design has improved. Uh, I'm really pumped about this one, so keep an eye out for that one. And finally, uh, David Hopp is the new president of Gen Con. So he's taking over. I went and read his biography. He had a lot to do with, he worked with Upper Deck, has a Magic the Gathering background and stuff. So will that change Gen Con? Well, we'll have to wait and see. All right, let's get to the Kickstarter news. Happy breakfast, everybody. The crowdfunding juggernaut continues on in gaming, so let's take a look at what's happening in our crowdfunding world today. While gamers are just delving into the massive game that is Seventh Continent, Serious Pulp is kickstarting the new What Goes Up Must Come Down expansion. The Seventh Continent is an expansive card-based exploration game that has players building characters and going on grand adventures trying to conquer curses. The intensity of the production has the publisher indicating that the game might not go to retail, so this Kickstarter is probably the best way to get this cooperative, savable adventure game. The What Goes Up Must Come Down expansion includes two new adventure modules that have unique gameplay elements. In the Prison of Clouds, you are in the skies being influenced by a wind track. You can go back and forth between the skies and the ground during your adventure, but with this there are risks like exhaustion and violent winds. In Veins of the Earth, it actually takes place beneath the continent with caverns and underground rivers and new dark dangers. And there's a new thematic satchel and journal binder that stores your quest item cards. 
Featuring over 250 new cards, plus what's been unlocked in a myriad of stretch goals, you can get the What Goes Up Must Come Down expansion for $49 plus shipping. Or if you want to explore the Seventh Continent for the first time, you can get the base game and expansion for $129 plus shipping. On the other end of the scale spectrum, we have Dice of Pirates, which is a quick push your luck dice game that has players vying for gold. There's player interaction because you can loot your opponents. Additionally, some die faces have opponents actually take over those dice and roll them, and they can even get gold when it's not their active turn. And of course, you have to beware of the Kraken, which can end your turn immediately. Dice of Pirates plays two to six players and comes packed in a mint-sized tin, but there are seven custom dice and some tokens included in that tiny game package. A copy of Dice of Pirates takes a pledge of just $10 plus shipping. Alo Darkness combines CCG-style deck building and MOBA-inspired gameplay. You'll be working to destroy towers in lane-based card combat, but there are also monster events that you get to battle as well as you work towards invading the opponent's base. Alo Darkness includes 30 heroes to choose from to build your deck around, and there are a huge number of deck permutations that you can craft. Heroes gain experience and get stronger, items can be purchased and upgraded, and there are powerful ganking moves that you get to make. Lane alignments and the give and take of the card play as you advance up the lanes is enhanced by the vibrant fantasy art. Although the deck building is intended to offer the strategic variety of a CCG, this is not a collectible game, and there are 400 or more cards included in the box. Alo Darkness takes a pledge of 49 euro for the base game, or for 58 euro you'll also be able to get the custom minis for the towers and minions. For all of you Resident Evil fans, Steamforged is kickstarting a cooperative survival board game for Resident Evil 2. Players will be seeking to escape the legendary Raccoon City, but must explore and search for clues, equipment, and weapons first. Players will take on the roles of familiar characters from the games, each with a unique thematic ability set. And there's a tension deck mechanism designed to keep the game tense and unpredictable. And of course, there are minis. A bunch of character and monster minis are included in the base game, and there are optional mini sets that you can add on as well. On top of that, this Kickstarter includes the B-Files expansion. You can get a copy of Resident Evil 2, the board game, for a pledge of £70 plus shipping. And finally, the T2029 Terminator 2 board game is a cooperative game in which players will be controlling the human army, trying to get John Connor to Skynet, and then hacking the defense grid to fight the future. You'll use multi-use command cards that serve as the means to hack, but also the threat of Skynet. Dice drafting serves as the core of the troop order system, and specialist tactic cards can be used to call down support as you operate tactically on the board, trying to hold certain positions for bonuses while fighting off Skynet forces. As you play, you will grow your skills that you can either specialize in or diversify in, and if you fail to hack Skynet, the code resets. The designer of T2029 is Ian O'Toole, who many of you may better know as the artist behind games like Lisboa and The Gallerist, but it's his game chops that are on display here in a game that features over 20 custom thematic minis. You can get a copy of T2029 Terminator 2 board game for a pledge of 87 Australian dollars. Alrighty, that's all I've got for you this episode. Hopefully something caught your eye. And until next time, I hope you have a wonderful week. Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here. Even though I almost wasn't here th this week, my internet's been down for nearly three days. Unfortunately, I have a metric ton of board games at my disposal that I can play to help pass the time until that sweet, sweet bandwidth returns. But you know, oddly enough, even without internet access this week, I have found myself still habitually reaching for my phone while I've played. I'll look up a clarification to that rule on BG... Oh, oh that's right, I have no internet. Alright, while well, you pick out the next game, I'll log my play for this... Oh, that's right, I have no internet. I'm gonna post a picture of our game on Instagram. Oh, that's right, I have no Instagram followers. It all makes me wonder, have we modern-day board gamers grown too internet-dependent? I mean, Look around at a convention, or even a game night at home with friends. How many devices are in use at the table?
There's an entire online ecosystem that has developed around the analog activity of pushing pieces of plastic and cardboard around the table. In fact, one wonders whether online board game content now has as much of an influence on the hobby as traditional physical brick and mortar outlets. Perhaps even more. For example, let's take a little quiz. Of your 10 most recent board game purchases, how many were made without first researching a review online, watching a playthrough video, listening to a podcast, or downloading a tutorial? And of those 10, how many games did you discover in person versus the unceasing chatter that populates our Twitter and Facebook feeds? Heck, when's the last time you walked out of a local store with a game that you knew nothing about going in? Uh, it certainly happens, sure, but I wonder if it's happening less and less frequently in our increasingly Wi-Fi world. So what it boils down to is, I'm wondering, has access to the virtual world become so ingrained in our daily routine that it now has a greater impact on the perpetuation of the board game hobby than the physical world does? I mean, I know that, for me at least, being disconnected this week has made me feel like I've been missing a portion of the board game experience. Not a substantial portion, but yeah, a portion nonetheless. So tell me. Am I overestimating the importance of internet access in the growth and sustainability of the board game industry? Let me know what you think in the comments below. Oh, uh, oh hey, hey, my internet's back. Huh. In the comments when we blah, the comments when the below, the, the, that expansion's back in stock. Oh, cool. Yes. So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? By the way, is the microphone still working? Melody? Um, Am I looking at the bottom? Yeah. Can you see the things moving? Yeah. Okay. So what's coming from the Dice Tower this week? Well, I'll be reviewing several games. A lot of people have bugged me to review Seventh Continent, so we're going to get that done. By Order of the Queen, uh, Melody and I will be taking a look at that. Uh, Betrayal at Baldur's Gate, which we played live last week, so you'll see a review of that coming. And I have a whole mess of other reviews. I'm trying to turn on the review engine full bore, so you'll see more of those coming later this week. Um, also, uh, Eric and I started Dice Tower tonight last week. Now, that normally is going to run every other week. Last week was kind of a pilot test run. We'll be doing another episode of that this week on Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And then we'll be doing it every other Wednesday from there on out. Of course, things will change based on schedules and conventions and stuff. But hopefully you guys enjoy that. It's about an hour long or a little bit maybe more show where we talk about games. You can come and ask us questions live and we'll answer them. So that's that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, our top 100 is continuing on. You'll see that this week. Um, two more sections of that, so hopefully you guys will continue to enjoy that. Let's keep going on with this show. Hello everyone, my name's Annette, and you may know me as Netter's Plays. And today on Applied Mechanics, I'm going to go over the game of Circle the Wagons. So Circle the Wagons is a small two-player game that is all about drafting and then laying your cards in a Tableau map grid system. So let me show you a little bit about the game and why I really enjoy it. So Circle the Wagons comes in this small little wallet case where there's only 18 cards in the whole game. After shuffling your cards, you're going to turn over three cards and place them in the center. This is going to set up the special scoring conditions for this game. You're then going to use the remaining cards to make a circle around the three cards that you just placed. On your turn, you can go ahead and take this first card and add it to your town. However, if you don't want it, you can take the card after that, or even the one after that. But for every one that you skip, you're going to go ahead and give those cards to your opponent. Every player is going to be building their own town and following certain placement rules. Once all cards have been drafted, then you're going to go ahead and add up your score. You're going to add up the territories, which is the background. You'll score one point for each territory in your largest region of that type. Additionally, you'll score points based on the three random cards that you selected at the beginning of the game. Drafting and selecting the best cards to place in your towns is very important for scoring the most amount of points. So normally drafting doesn't work in a two-player game, but it does work in Circle the Wagons. 
and it works because there's open available information for both players to pick and choose from. Another reason that I really enjoy this game is because there's only 18 cards within the game itself. However, the placement of the cards within that circle always makes it different every time. And that's why we really enjoy Circle the Wagons. So thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye! Well, the hurricane and conventions have really slowed down what I was planning to make a mini series about local game stores. Um, and last time I talked about how uh, I don't feel like it's our responsibility to keep a local game store in business. Um, and I want to make clear here that I am really for friendly local game stores. I really want the good ones to succeed. Although to be honest, the ones that aren't doing good, the ones that don't do a good job at promoting the hobby, I don't really care if they succeed or not. I don't feel that they should be supported just because they exist. But there is a big push right now to save the local game stores. But I, again, I want to make it clear that I like get local game stores, but I'm a little wary about this movement per se. And we're going to talk about how they are trying to push this movement next week, but I want to talk about reasons for the movement and why I don't think that they're necessarily that important. So we have the local game stores, right? And they are pushing things by uh, minimum advertised pricing and things like that. And again, we'll talk about that next week. But why? Why do local stores need saving? Well, there's a lot of reasons given for it. The one reason which I won't get into because I'm not an expert on the subject is keep the money in your local economy where you should buy there instead of buying from the grandiose worldwide economy. I'm not convinced that that matters that much. However, I'm not an expert on economics, so I can't speak for or against that. But I can speak for many of the other things that are said. One thing is that stores provide a, a, a community for gaming. And if you don't support that community, that community will go away. Well, first of all, hogwash to the second part. I'm sorry. If the local game stores in many areas disappeared, would there still be a community for gaming? There most definitely would be. How do we know this? Because there are many places without local game stores and they still have a gaming community. In our area where we don't have a good local game store right now, we have a pretty big community of gamers and many of them never even go to the local game store to play. And so the local game store fostering community, it can do that, it can, but it's not necessary to do that. Also, the promoter of games, you know, the, the local community is one telling everyone about new games that come out. You go there to discover new games. Yeah, that was something in the 80s. It's not something now. Now we learn about new games from all different sources, mostly online. And so you can go online to learn about new games. They also say that the game store is someone that gets someone into the hobby. And you know what? There's truth to that, right? People get into the hobby from going to your local game store and finding out about games. But you know what? Many more people these days are getting into it through other ways. If you talk to someone my age or someone in their 50s or 60s and you say something to the effect of, you know, how'd you get in the hobby? And there's a good chance they'll say it was because of my local game store. Talk to someone under the age of 30 and you will almost never hear that. They'll say, oh, I got into it because this couple invited us to their house to play games. I got into this because I saw this game and I went online and looked and found this video which led me here. I happen to be in this place here and learned about games this way. There are so many different ways that are promoting gaming. The local game store does not hold some sort of cool little monopoly on bringing new people to the hobby. And in fact, many local stores do a horrific job of chasing people away from the hobby. I run a local uh, meetup at my store and uh, many times uh, people have come in, they play games, they look around, they feel uncomfortable, they leave, never to be seen again. Thanks, local store. Good job that you're doing. Also, then there's the online destruction of stores, right? The online evil game stores, and maybe Amazon is evil, I don't know, but all the other online, so they just lump them all together, and I will be talking about that in the future, how the online gaming store is not an instrument of evil. In fact, I think it's an instrument of good far above any local game store, I'm sure. You guys want to hear that one. But I don't, you know, so they're all oh, these are destroying us with their prices and stuff. Then be competitive. The one thing I always say to local game stores, if you want me to shop there, you need to make me want to shop there. When I go there and I'm like, ooh, that's cheaper online. Okay, maybe it is cheaper online, but you should make me feel really bad that I'm not buying it from you. Because if I'm not feeling really bad about buying it from you, you're like, well, why am I supporting this place? Yeah, why am I supporting this place? You need to make us want to support you. See, the thing is, is this online business, this online is not a po, you know, is not this evil enemy of local game stores. An online community provides so much these days. It's cheaper to buy games online. It just is. 
online, because of online, gaming industry has grown. You know what? Local game stores have been around for decades and decades and decades. When did board gaming explode? When the internet showed up. So stop telling us, people on the internet, how we are ruining the hobby when the hobby is huge now. And it's garbage to say otherwise. And it, you can, meetup.com, facebook.com, all sorts of different groups that you can find online. And you can get together and game because you find people with the same likes online. You can you know, oh, go to a store and get a demo of a game. You can do that, although I, I, I can less than a hand five local game stores that have actually done that in my life. Most of them have broken up games in the back. But online, you can go watch Rodney Smith and other people explain you exactly how to play a game. You can see neat demos. There's a new Dice app for the um, iPad and thing where you'll be able to learn games online. Local game stores are no longer needed to do demos. I can go to an online gaming thing, uh, Gametopia and other places, and just play the game and figure it out. Or download the app that matches the game and learn about it. The local game store does have interaction. But you don't always want that interaction. I may not necessarily want to play a game where there's a bunch of people cursing up a storm at one table or speaking sexist, misogynistic talk at another table or just treating me like I'm scum because I wanted to join their gaming group and I might not like the same games they do exactly or I just don't fit in with them. Online community is much more welcoming. Now this sounds like I'm going on a rant against local game stores. I'm not. Every time I go to a new city, I want to go to the local game stores. I want to go see them. And there are some great local game stores that I've gone to. There's Portal up in uh, Connecticut. That was a great local game store. Madness in uh, Texas that I had a great time at. And actually, I better stop here now because I might miss some stores. So I'll miss a lot of stores. But I've been to a lot of great gaming stores. But they are few and far between. And I don't feel like we should go out of our way to support them, especially when I'm not in the same city as them. I can talk about them a little bit here in the podcast, but I'm going to talk about online game stores because they're supporting the entire country slash world with what they do. And so are we here at the Dice Tower. Local, go local game stores, do they need saving? I don't think they do. I think there are ways that they can make their, way, you know, make their product better, and that's something I'll talk about in the future. How can a local game store get your business? How can you improve? Anyway, until next time, this has been Tom Thanks. Hey everyone, it's lunchtime! Today we're going to be looking at Bob Ross, The Art of Chill. This is a game by uh, Big G Productions, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, and it <laughs> plays two to four players, ages 12 and up, in about 30 minutes. So, Bob Ross, the point of this game is to get the most chill points. So in the game, you're trying to paint the wonderful paintings that are on the fun easel. We have the score track, which as we said before, counts the chill points. You have actions such as choosing paint cards and also paint brushes. You also get to roll the bob die. This is a mandatory action that you have to do before every uh, turn that you have. And it encourages you to either take a card, which has a, it's a Bob Ross card, and it has an action like taking additional actions or maybe not moving Bob, because you don't want him to go too far on the painting because you can cover those extra points that you can get for, co for completing certain paintings. What else happens, Tracy? Lots of fun. You know, basically the idea is you're trying to obviously make fluffy clouds or happy trees or mountains or a cabin. So by spending, or basically putting paints onto your palette to do the combinations that are on the picture, you're going to hopefully earn chill points by bonuses, by technique cards. Yeah, so techniques or cards are great because you just have to toss two cards of the same color, same color paints, and then you get the technique cards giving you additional points every time you complete a painting mm -hmm. with that color. I really mm -hmm. love the technique cards. Way to rack up the big points. <laughs> Absolutely, and quick. So I was surprised at how much I liked this game. It's so nostalgic. I remember sitting as a child in the 80s watching him on TV, so. Oh, no. <laughs> I didn't watch Bob Ross on TV, but I really liked the game, so. Yeah, I, I honestly thought, oh, it's gonna be one of those games, like, oh, yeah, okay, it's Bob Ross's face on it, it's not gonna be very good. Surprisingly, we had a lot of fun. Even Did. during this video, we were like, okay, we only need a few, a little bit of footage, <laughs> and we just wanted to keep playing. So it was definitely chill, and we really yeah. liked it. So nostalgic fun. We enjoyed it. Definitely it, something you played your lunch, but longer lunch. A little bit longer, and anyone can pick it up, so it's great. You don't actually have to peel the paint. Yes. So. <laughs> no skill required. So just in case, I think this comes out just before. This is available October 1st, and they'll be selling at Target. So if you can't find it, 
That's why it's just at Target. So definitely a winner for us and we'll be playing again soon. Oh yeah. Yeah, so that's it for now. We'll see you all next time. Bye. 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 Hello, my name is Neil Sulzbeispiele and today in the best and the worst we are talking about Masmora from Simon Games. So jump into it and see what I like on it. My favorite part of Masmora is by far this one moment you're waiting for the whole game. This takes, this super take that moment. Let's assume uh, Algus and Jay have four and two health points left and you are here. So whenever you're going into a room adjacent to a trap, it fires one time. So you can take one um, one life point back from them, but you want a little bit more. So first of all, you are pl playing this lightning here. You say this straight line, each character gets one wound. One, two. So now you have a vampire bite. In each adjacent room, each player gets a wound. Psh, green is already dead and Algus is still staying there. So Jay is already dead. Next one is another lightning and this is how it works. So, so you play it again and again and now you're going in and also Argus is dead. You are going out taking another wound but you have survived and they are dead. Say so they will resurrect next round but that's it. That's the brilliant moment you're waiting for the whole game. Um, uh, the negative point and the thing I don't like on it is probably just me. It's just me. My expectations were so high after Acadia Quest and in my opinion it's not 100% as good as Acadia Quest. Just 98%. I like Acadia Quest a little bit more about the quest mode and uh, my expectations were so high that I'm slightly disappointed by just having a one-shot game. But again, that is just my personal problem and that is the only negative thing on the game, which is weird, or? Gosh, is that sweet. That was Masmara from Simon Games. I like it. So, see you next week here on the Board Game Breakfast. My name is Niels and have fun! So for today, what's on this shelf? We're taking a look at one of my home shelves for the games that the kids play. What are the games that we keep here? Outfox, this is, when someone says, what game should I get for my kids? I definitely point them to Dr. Eureka and Outfox, Animal Upon Animal, and My First Stone Age. These are like four amazing games. This is a cooperative game where you're working together logically to solve who, which fox is the thief. Dr. Eureka is a mix between logic and dexterity, great for kids playing adults. Animal Upon Animal Animals, a dexterity game where you're stacking animals on top of each other. And my first Stone Age is a resource collection game. Now over here, these are not so fantastic necessarily, but my kids really like them. This one here, this glitter, whatever it's called, the Unicorns in the Clouds. It's just a roll and move game, but my kids love it. Action Princesses is just a bunch of dice and different games in it. Crazy Mixed Up Zoo is a game where you basically, it's good for little kids, you mix up a bunch of things and everyone looks at them and then you change one and everyone has to decide what you've changed. Zitter Nix is kind of like a pickup sticks type style game. And Monopoly Tropical Tycoon is actually not for kids. It's actually a really well designed Monopoly game using a DVD, which is almost outdated technology at this point. Um, but it, it has casinos and all sorts of cool things. Really, really fun game. And that's what's on the shelf this week. Hi, everyone. The Harkin Engel Protocol was an international agreement against the worst forms of child labor. It was signed in 2001 by all the big players in the cacao industry. But in 2004 it seemed that none of the companies that signed the protocol were upholding their agreements. The Dutchman Teun van der Keuke took the matters into his own hands. He recorded himself eating 17 bars of chocolate and subsequently took himself to court for knowingly purchasing and consuming an illegally manufactured product. To make a case against himself, he convinced four former cacao plantation child slaves to testify against him. The court ruled that the case was outside the jurisdiction of the Dutch Attorney General and Teun started his own brand, Tony Choco Lonely, an alternative for slave-free chocolate bars. Over time the industry proved hard to change, so they had to change the tagline to striving to be 100% slave-free. This week was announced that Tony's Choco Lonely chocolate bars will be going public. 
This week, I will be playing a game that puts your workers to work, trying to give your tribe the victory. This week, I'm delving deep into the world of... Cacao. Cacao is a tile laying game. When it is your turn, you put one of your own worker tiles on the board orthogonally, my new favorite word. The number of workers depicted on the tile that you place decide the strength of your action. And on most spots you will be allowed to add another tile to the board. And so you collect cacao, money, water, sell to the market or get the majority, try to get the majority in the temples. The game is easy, but still has some great choices in it. It plays fast, so it's great as either a filler or a family game. A big recommend for me for Tony's Choco Lonely Slave Free Chocolate Bars and for the game Cacao. My name is Dave Luzan. Thanks for watching. Hi, Mike Delicio from Solo Mode Games. Cthulhu, you know him, you love him. We know game developers love him because there are a lot of games with the Cthulhu mythos attached. Today, I want to shine a solo mode spotlight on one of the newer games that I've got in that genre, and that is Fate of the Elder Gods, designed by Richard Launius, Daryl Lauder, and Chris Kirkman, and coming from Fabled Nexus Games. Let's take to the table. In Fate of the Elder Gods, you're going to take control of one of these great older ones, and you play cultists who are attempting to awaken that great older one. Working against you are the investigators in the solo game. You are attempting to Awaken your Great Old One by moving its summoning marker all the way up to nine before the Great, uh, or excuse me, before the Investigators can get the Elder Signs up to ten to shut you down. You do this by playing cards. You can play cards to move the piece around, and at each location there's a particular action that's associated with it. These actions will let you do things like draw other spell cards, manipulate the movement of your cultists around the board, and ideally move up your summoning marker to get to nine. Each location has a basic action and a control action, and you gain control if you have more of your cultists than the investigators, or you can roll the dice to try to get temporary control. It's a very clever game, a quick game, um, easy to set up and play and easy to tear down. The solo mode, I think, does a pretty nice job of replicating uh, not exactly the multiplayer experience, but definitely a fun and robust experience all on its own. There you have Fate of the Elder Gods. It's not easy to stand out with a theme that's been used as much as the Lovecraft theme has, but Fate of the Elder Gods does a really good job of it. Thank you so much for your time, and have a great day. On this episode, we have someone that's trying to look for a game to raffle off at a local event that they're running to raise funds for their local group. So, let's see what we got for them. Hi, I'm Gary Pope, and this is Late to the Table, where we go on the board game subreddit and look under the daily personalized game recommend... Wait, Gary, did it change? Wait, wait, did they change it back to what should I get? Wait a second. Oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. Board games... Yeah. <sighs> Gary, you know it was only for a day, right? They only changed it for a day. But, um, yeah, you go into the daily personalized game recommendation, and then we try to suggest games for people. So, let's see what we got. Illuminati... <laughs> That's a great name, by the way. Uh, Illuminati's looking for a heavy euro to raffle off as a prize at a local event that's going on. They're trying to raise funds for their host, who puts a lot of money out of their pockets so they could go ahead and reserve these venues. So they're just trying to raise money for that. Now, before we get into the games, I help run a lot of these little raffle things myself. So here's some quick tips. First tip is I would definitely give as many options as possible. Offering only one prize will then have some people not participate because they might already own that one prize. So the more the better. And along with offering more than one game, also offer a variety of games. Some people might not care about having the rarest game, they might just want a really good popular game, and vice versa. And while doing this, I've raised hundreds and hundreds of dollars doing this, and not only that, the raffling tickets also go to help pay for the raffle prizes as well, so you don't have to worry about that once you run it successfully. Also bear in mind, it helps a ton if you approach people as well, informing them of the raffle. If you just yelled in front of the room, some people might not even hear it. Now just some rare games I would suggest 
would be Food Chain Magnet, Chinatown, and Vinyos Deluxe Edition. Now, while I would suggest Rare Games is that it might entice those collectors to throw over a bit more money than you'd expect from them. Now, if you want Cult of the New, I would suggest getting Scythe, the Wind Gamut Expansion, First Martians, and Lisboa. Now, even though some of these games are not available to purchase at the moment, you can also just give out a voucher and they can collect that at another time. And what's good about getting the Cult of the New is that you can almost guarantee that most likely these people do not have at least most of these games. And if you want to get games that you know that people will like, you can go ahead and get Scythe, a Feast for Odin, and also Terraforming Mars. And that was another episode, what should I get? Be sure to ask your questions on the board game subreddit underneath the daily personalized game recommendation, I guess. And um, yeah, until next time, hope you're enjoying your breakfast. Hello, my name's Dan, and this is Cora, and we're here today to talk to you about board games for children of around five and under. And today, we're going to talk about this game. What is it, Cora? Reef Root. Reef Root. Reef Root is a game for two to four players, and probably suits the older end of our five and under age bracket, as it needs quite a bit of tactical thinking. In the game, you're racing your fish across a treacherous ocean in order to get back to the safety of a coral reef. Not only are you trying to beat all your opponent's fish, however, but you've also got to avoid the dangerous predators along the way. On your turn, you roll a dice to find out what type of fish you're going to be moving, either a coloured fish or a predator. While, on the face of it, this might seem like a simple roll and move game, there are real tactical choices to be made here as you try and move your opponent's fish towards the predators and your own fish towards safety. You win the game if one of your fish reaches the safety of the coral reef, or if you manage to get the predators to eat all your opponent's fish. If your kids struggle with games that have a take that element in it, then this might not be for you. However, if not, then it's one I can really recommend. So Cora, what did you think about Reef Root? Um, I like it. I like how you can um, eat other people's fish. You can eat other people's fish, yeah. I know it's you eating lots of my fish. <laughs> I ended up winning. You ended up winning because you ate all my fish. I didn't even get any in. You didn't even get to the end, did you? You ate all my fish before you got to the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely little tactical game. And it's also a nice little take that game as well. It's, it reminds me of chess in a very basic way. Huh? It, well, it's, no, you're right. It's nothing like chess, but you're moving things around and taking other people's pieces. So maybe a bit like chess. If chess had sharks and orcas and fish and was set under the sea. I don't even know what chess is. She doesn't even know what chess is. I don't know why I'm bothering explaining it. <laughs> so we give Reef Root to Flying Fish thumbs up. All right, that's it for another board game breakfast, guys. Thanks so much for coming along for the ride. I hope to see you guys this week as we have lots of videos coming your way. We are currently playing through a couple of really <laughs> exciting games that we can't talk about yet, but you'll be hearing about them very, very shortly. We're now in October, the last fourth of the year. 2017 has been a great year so far, despite hurricanes, despite tragedy, despite all the stuff that's happened. It's still been a fantastic year, and we appreciate you guys and all the nice things you say. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and this has been Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching. think.com.